When we think about bone health or osteoporosis and food, the first thing most people think about is calcium. When we talk about calcium, the first thing most people think about is milk and dairy foods. So it's easy to make the simple jump from needing calcium to prevent osteoporosis to needing dairy foods to prevent osteoporosis. But the evidence is that bone health involves so much more than just calcium. It is a complicated area with many contributing factors coming from both our diets and our lifestyles. Most people consider a diet without dairy unhealthy. Without dairy foods, how could we obtain sufficient calcium for our bones? Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you chippers are in the world. Uh, Dr. Sal, Lifestyle Medicine, just wanted to say hello to everyone before we start talking about bone health. And this is really another interesting topic to talk about. Um, before we get into uh, what we're going to really focus on today, I just want to remind everyone to the right of your screen, there's a little chat button. If you click on that, you can put your questions in the chat box and I'll get to them before the end of the session. And uh, we're gonna look at um, the relationships and the myths surrounding bone health and calcium and dairy. And really just talking about the first myth, it's really interesting. Bones need calcium to be healthy. Cow's milk contains calcium. So therefore, it must be that humans must need cow's milk. Obviously, we know from so much of the research that that's not the case, that there really is a myth, which was just alluded to, that we need calcium to keep our bones healthy, but we certainly don't need cow's milk to get the calcium to keep our bones healthy. That's really just you know, a lot of the myth that's been precipitated by commercials for so many years. Um, in addition to putting in your questions into the chat box, we have a few questions that have uh, that will come up on the screen. Um, and the first one, if we can run the first poll, uh, which has the most calcium? And you can put your answers in there. Is it dairy? Is it bok choy? Is it broccoli? And I'll, I'll give you the answers as we go along. Everybody can put their answers in. And really looking at where to get your calcium is important. Obviously, we need to keep our bones healthy so we don't have a fracture as we get older, so that we don't develop osteoporosis, which we'll talk about today, so that we don't fall down because the bones have to be strong to keep you upright and such. So it really is important to know where should you be getting your calcium from. Most people had picked bok choy and um, and uh, broccoli, and bok choy actually has the most calcium. The next one is um, countries that drink the most milk have the least osteoporosis or the most osteoporosis. Now, again, we really have to be careful. What is the myth that's been precipitated for so many years by the commercials that we see on te television that milk keep your bones strong? Is that really the case? So it looks like 95% of the people know that uh, countries that drink the most milk have the most osteoporosis, which is absolutely correct. For the few people that thought the opposite, the research clearly shows that people that have more dairy have more problems with osteopenia, weakening of the bones, and osteoporosis. And we'll talk about that uh, more as, as uh, the session goes on today. Now, the third one, lactose intolerance is usually found in children or in adults. So that is a really interesting question. Lactose intolerance basically means that you cannot tolerate lactose, the protein that's in milk. And why is that? As we get older, we start, adults really start to lose their ability to make lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down the lactose protein, milk protein. So um, it looks like it's going to be not necessarily an even split, but it looks like it's 30, 65 to 34 or 35% so far. So the, uh, it usually occurs over time, as we know that many kids or most kids really seem to tolerate cow's milk early on, 
But then as time goes on, and certainly as they become adolescents and, in, and adults, they lose the ability to create the, the enzyme that allows you to break down the lactose, the milk protein. Um, and that's important. And it really gets you to think, are adults supposed to be drinking cow's milk? Are we really supposed to be having dairy? If we can't tolerate it, what does that actually tell us? The body is almost giving you a message that, hey, whatever it is that you're taking in, which is so important, whether it's milk, whether it's cheese or yogurt or some other dairy product, is not necessarily doing the body good. So we want to really take that message home. And then the next one is, which is the best source of vitamin D? Plant foods, vitamin D supplements, or sunshine? And we'll wait a few seconds to let everybody answer that one. And really, it's important to look at, you know, sources of vitamin D. And one of the things that we do in our practice is we check everyone, despite the fact that we live in Florida, we're in a sunshine climate. Um, I think when we spend time outside, we're either putting lotion on to protect ourselves from the sun and decrease the risk of skin cancer, which is obviously very important, or we're covered up and we're wearing a hat and sunglasses and such. So sunshine came up as 94% as the best source and vitamin D supplements and plant foods less, obviously. But one of the things that I see in my practice is many times, probably about 70 or 80% of the patients that I check in my practice are actually deficient in vitamin D, despite the fact that they may spend some time in the sun. So those individuals really need to be supplemented with vitamin D supplements. Vitamin D is really interesting. It, it probably should also be called hormone D because every single cell in your body has a receptor for vitamin D. So it definitely does a lot more for health than just keeping your bones healthy. So sunshine, vitamin D, we'll talk more about nutrition. And in the next clip, we're going to look at uh, clip five next. We're going to talk a little bit more about risk factors. So we'll look at that video and then I'll come back on the other side and we'll talk more about the risk factors for bone loss. Osteoporosis is sometimes referred to as thinning of the bones. This is a reasonably accurate description since the bones do become weak and more likely to fracture. This is a condition that's mainly a problem for women after the change of life or menopause. Those women more at risk are thin, usually Caucasian or Asian, and sedentary with minimal exercise habits. If you have overactive thyroid that's not being treated, that can cause osteoporosis also. By now you know that an ounce of prevention is worth, and you know the rest. That's right, a pound of cure. Making a habit of being physically active on a regular basis works your muscles and stimulates bone growth. Regular sunshine on a daily basis is important to allow your body to make sufficient vitamin D, which is needed for strong bones. 15 to 20 minutes of direct sunlight daily is a good idea. For people with darker skin, sunlight is just as important and a few extra minutes a day is recommended. Also necessary is sufficient calcium intake from healthy sources. A plant-based diet containing a wide variety of foods can provide sufficient calcium and other nutrients protective of bone health. So in summary, your risk of osteoporosis can be greatly decreased and can also be treated by regular weight-bearing exercise, by sufficient sun exposure, which allows your body to make vitamin D, as well as by a diet containing sufficient calcium intake from healthy sources. Okay, so I'm going to go through that again. So the risk factors are, as was mentioned, thin Caucasian or Asian women, but men can certainly develop osteoporosis. Being sedentary, we know that's a significant risk, and we know that that probably is almost as equivalent as being a smoker. They say sitting is the new smoking, which is really true, and it's one of the reasons why I'm actually standing up at my desk. I spend a lot of time in my, either in my home office or in the office at work standing up because it's actually healthful for the bones and for your, your entire skeletal system and your muscles to actually stand up and weight bear. And we know that that lowers your risk of osteoporosis. And then as also was mentioned, if you have overactive thyroid, that can decrease uh, bone, uh, that can increase bone loss. Um, but one of the other things that I'll mention is also the fact that medications 
such as the uh, ant antacid medications like amiprazole, the acid lowering medications can also increase the risk of osteoporosis. So any medications that you're taking potentially have side effects. You really do need to know what are the side effects. And this is something that I would be sure that anyone that's taking medicine or thinking of taking medicine should really talk to their physician about what are the benefits? What are the risks? Um, are the risks too great? Are the benefits really that strong enough to really require medication? Weight-bearing exercise was mentioned. That is phenomenally helpful for bone strength. And as we get older, we want to make sure that we're doing resistance exercise, body weight exercises, weight lifting with dumbbells and barbells and kettlebells, because those things really help not only to lower your risk of osteoporosis, but also to increase your metabolism, to keep your weight down, and to really just keep you uh, overall healthy. Um, we're going to go to the next, uh, yeah, to the next video. We'll take a look at that, and I will talk after that. Vitamin D is also very important for bone health. It plays a key role in the absorption of calcium in the small intestine, as well as facilitating skeletal materialization and stimulating bone absorption. Vitamin D is a unique nutrient in that while foods contain small amounts of this vitamin, we get most of it from exposing skin to sunlight. Living in colder climates where we cover up more and having a darker skin tone can also lead to less vitamin D production. However, regular safe sun exposure can be the vital part of maintaining adequate vitamin D levels. Okay, well that's good. So again, we hear the messages that it's important to get calcium, but it's important to know where it's where it's coming from to strengthen your bones with vitamin D. And again, I'll, I'll repeat, measuring your vitamin D is really important. So at least once a year, when you get your wellness exam done, in addition to checking your blood sugar and your cholesterol profile, get a vitamin D level, make sure that that is where it should be around 40 or 50 or even 60, depending on the lab. Um, and make sure that the level is re really where it needs to be. Um, there's, a cat, there's a slide that we'll look at, which gives a, a great pictorial of where calcium comes from. Again, to put it in your brain, where you should re really be getting your, your uh, calcium from. So we'll take a look at that slide. So this is great. So going from left to right, you can see that bok choy is the number one that was on the poll. Uh, collard greens, kale, broccoli, a lot less, obviously, sesame seeds, soybeans, milk, way down on the spectrum. And again, looking at the benefits and risks, what are the benefits of eating all of those green leafy vegetables? We know that you get calcium, you get fiber, there's no fat in there. There are all min other minerals and vitamins that are really healthful. So we want to be sure that our diet primarily is made up of plant-based foods and less processed foods. And we'll keep cow's milk completely out of the equation for now. And with the next video clip uh, that we'll look at, clip number one, uh, we'll again talk about the, the myth surrounding dairy. This is very interesting to listen to. A 12-year prospective nurse's health study found participants who consume two or more servings of milk a day were at increased risk of hip and forearm fracture. This does not mean that dairy causes osteoporosis. However, it does suggest that dairy products are not protecting us from osteoporosis as we have been made to believe since our childhood. On the contrary, studies show fruits and vegetables are protective against osteoporosis. The evidence shows that while calcium is important for bone health, milk and dairy products are not needed to ensure healthy bones. In fact, many of the world's population cannot even tolerate cow's milk. So that's really interesting, you know, and she says very clearly 
We don't need dairy products to have strong, healthy bones. We don't need dairy, cow's milk, for any reason. And when, when you think about it, this, this myth has been precipitated. Why does lactose intolerance occur? Why do we have so many problems? And actually, the, whether it's dairy or whether it's animal protein, anything that you eat or drink that changes the pH, the acid level of your blood, will increase or decrease the risk of osteoporosis. And as it turns out, and research shows this very clearly, when you're having more dairy, when you're having more animal protein, it can change the pH in your body. When, you, when your pH, when your acid level increases, your body has to do something to buffer the acid to get your pH back up to the normal physiologic level. And one place that it takes a buffer from is your bones. It actually takes calcium from your bones to create a normal pH again, a normal acid level again. So again, that increases your risk for osteoporosis. So we really need to know what happens physiologically and metabolically when we eat and drink certain things. And that knowledge allows you to make the right decisions when you're deciding for a particular meal or you're deciding to have a drink, uh, whether it be water or something else, not, not alcohol. Uh, but again, lactose intolerance, we'll, we'll look at another clip, clip number two, that talks a little bit more about lactose intolerance. Why does this occur, as I alluded to this morning? And we'll talk a little bit more about the myths surrounding that. So we'll watch clip number two next. Milk naturally contains a sugar called lactose, which is broken down with the help of an enzyme called lactase, which is a natural production of the body. For many people, once they pass two to five years of age, the body stops producing lactase and they are no longer able to digest this sugar effectively, which can lead to abdominal pain, bloating, and gas. It has been estimated that 30 million people in North America are lactose intolerant, with rates of lactose intolerance varying widely across the world. So again, just a little bit more information about what happens uh, as we get older. We stop developing that enzyme and we can't break down that lactose any longer. And um, really, again, the, the myth. So newborn babies need mother's milk. Cows, milk. cows produce milk. So then the thought has been, well, if cows produce milk and babies need milk, then babies must need cow's milk, which, which obviously we know is not correct. And it's really interesting to look back at that video when the individual is actually uh, milking the cow. What ends up in that bucket, and you can see like there's a foam on the top of the milk itself. We know that there's a lot of bacteria in milk. There is a lot of contamination from pesticides that end up going through the animals. Uh, bacteria and other contaminants in there, including antibiotics and hormones. So milk in and of itself is not a healthy food product for so many reasons. And now that there are all these milk substitutes, almond milk, soy milk, rice milk, we have other more natural sources of milk that we can be and should be consuming that we know will keep us healthier. So we start to think about all of these myths what do we do to really focus our attention and make sure that we have the knowledge that we need to make the right decisions for every meal or for most meals? Um, none of us are 100%, myself included. We don't always do the right thing when it comes to our lifestyle and our nutrition and exercise. But if you're doing that most of the time, 80, 90% of the time, you're certainly heading yourself down the road to being healthier. Again, I'll remind you, we have about another 10 minutes. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box and that would be really helpful. I'll answer them as we go along. And then the last clip that we're gonna look at, uh, Darren Morton talks uh, more about exercise, resistance exercise, and what actually happens when you're not exercising. So we will look next at uh, clip number six and then we'll chat a little bit more about that on the other end. For many people, when they hear the word strength building exercises, also known as resistance exercises, it conjures images of young males with big egos in the gyms grunting abnormally loudly, eager to impress the fairer sex. 
But the truth is that that is wrong on two accounts. For one, to do effective strength building exercises, you don't need to join a gym. In fact, you can be your own gym in the convenience of your own home. The second thing is that it's not just young males that can benefit from resistance exercises. In fact, if I were asked who could most benefit, I would reply the opposite demographic. It's probably older females that stand to gain the most. And the reason for that is there's three distinct things that are achieved through resistance exercises. And the first one is that resistance exercises increase our muscle strength and increase our muscle tone. You see, as we grow older, we tend to experience sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass. And when we lose muscle mass, we lose functionality, we lose strength, and there's a whole range of other problems that are associated with that. For example, stability. We're more prone to falling, if that's the case. And so one thing is by doing resistance exercises, you can help preserve your lean muscle tissue, which is a real positive. The second thing, and this is fundamentally important, is that when you do strength exercises, not only do you improve the muscle strength, you also improve the strength of all the other things that support muscles, and that includes bones. And we know that one of the best ways to improve your bone density, which tends to decrease after the third decade of life, sadly, is to do resistance type activities. And then the third thing, and you're gonna be interested in this, so listen up. We know that resistance exercises, by improving your muscle tone, can actually boost your metabolism. Now, if you know and are envious of those people who can eat copious amounts of food and are still as skinny as a bean pole, whereas we know there are other people who just walk past a cake shop and the smell goes straight to their thighs, we know that often the reason for that is because of your metabolic rate, your resting speed at which you burn energy. What we know is that resistance exercises are very effective for dialing up your metabolism. So, if you are interested in A, keeping up your muscle strength, muscular strength and functionality, B, improving your bone strength, and C, dialing up your energy expenditure even whilst you're sleeping, then resistance exercises are for you. So resistance exercises we know are for everyone. As Darren mentioned, they're probably even more important as women get older. I think it also has to do with the fact that a lot of women as they get older don't like to uh, lift weights, but it is absolutely something that we all should do as we get older. And Darren also mentioned, you know, sarcopenia. So that's the word of the day that you should uh, impress your friends with. That means the loss of muscle cells. And as you decrease the muscles that you have on your bones, you're decreasing your metabolism, you're lowering your ability to burn calories, if you will. Weight often becomes a problem as a result of that. The muscles are weak, the bones are weak, you have more resistance to falling. So you can see all the complications that occur as a result of that. So it's important to do resistance exercises. It's important to do weight-bearing exercise. I don't actually need weights to do weight-bearing exercise. I can do squats, I can do lunges, I can do push-ups and sit-ups and use my own muscles to make sure that I'm exercising in a healthy way on a regular basis. So um, in summary, it's really important to do your exercise on a regular basis to make sure that you're getting resistance and weight-bearing exercise in addition to your aerobic exercise. We talked about the importance of sunshine and vitamin D checking your level of vitamin D to make sure that it's adequate. If it's not adequate, not at an optimal range, then you should probably get a little more sunshine, take a vitamin D supplement if you need to. Make sure that you're getting your calcium from healthy sources, from mostly plant-based foods, and we talk about that obviously over and over again, and that's what we teach in the CHIP program. So that gives people the tool, the CHIP program, as I've said before, gives individuals the tool to take that knowledge and to put it into action, whether it be in their kitchen, whether it be when they go out to dinner, making the right choices, um, and also realizing that plant-based foods uh, give you a lot of other minerals and antioxidants and vitamins that are vitally important to keeping all of your cells healthy. So, I want to thank everyone for, we'll get onto a few questions, but I want to thank everyone for what you all do as either CHIP participants, as graduates, as facilitators, 
Again, talk to your family and friends and make sure that your physician knows about the CHIP program. Uh, certainly, if I can do anything to help, just refer them on to me and you'll have my information uh, on the last slide. So uh, here's one question. I'm a female, 68, severe osteoporosis, vegan, thin, and I exercise. What is your recommendation on no medications and prefer to keep it that way? Well, I would really look at, uh, because a lot of individuals will say that they are vegan, but they might be eating more vegan junk food. So we really have to look specifically at what an individual is eating to be sure that they're getting six to nine servings of vegetables and a few fruits per day, that the calcium level is normal, which you can measure. You can measure the other minerals that are important to bone health. You can measure vitamin D and also looking at the exercise in and of itself, because again, as, as we both, Darren and I both mentioned today, a lot of people do resistance exercises uh, I'm sorry, aerobic exercise, but they don't do as much resistance and weight bearing. So that certainly is something that we would look at to be sure that we know why that individual that asked the question is developing or has developed severe osteoporosis and what we can do to turn the tables. Now, I'm not anti-medicine. Obviously, I'm, I'm an internist, but you know, I really try to focus on the natural things, the lifestyle behavior things that really make a difference but sometimes medications are necessary. And when they're necessary, and maybe in this particular situation, this individual might need to think and talk to their physician about what medicines might be helpful if you have severe osteoporosis. Is this lactose intolerance somewhat genetically based? It probably is because not everyone develops lactose intolerance. Some adults, even much older adults, can drink milk and eat cheese without any problems. So it probably is some sort of inheritance, some sort of genetic predisposition where that individual just turns off the gene, the gene in that, in that individual just turns off and that person can't, can't tolerate lactose any longer. So it is, but we know that lifestyle really creates so many problems. And if you know that you are an individual who is lactose or dairy intolerant, what do you do? You basically stay away from those things that cause the abdominal bloating and the gas and all of the other GI symptoms that come along with that. Uh, but as Darren mentioned before, you know, looking at metabolism is really important. We just recently bought a machine in our office called InBody. This is a, such a cool machine because what it does is not only does it measure your weight, it calculates your body mass index, which is the correlation between your height and your weight, but it also measures your percent body fat, and it gives you an indication of how, how well your metabolism is or how high your metabolism is or how low it is. Um, so we like to look at particular markers to get an indication of metabolism and to really help with the overall lifestyle changes that we really need to make. What are some resistance exercises? Obviously, as I just mentioned before, you can do calisthenics in your house. You can do body weight exercises at home. You can do just your own body weight. You can do squats and lunges. You can grab things that are heavy around your house and just lift those up. If you don't have weights, um, you can use resistance bands, which are helpful. That's resistance exercise. So you could do biceps, you could do triceps, you could do shoulders, you could do your chest and back. So if you're not really sure about what to do as far as an exercise routine, hook up with a trainer, somebody that can give you some instructions, and you might need to meet with him or her just once or twice to develop a routine that you can do at home. You might also want to in, uh, invest in getting some weights for the house. Right now with the pandemic happening, people, uh, I think we're all a little leery about going out uh, to a gym. So set up your own gym in your own home or your own garage and just make sure that you're able to get your exercise on a regular basis. Um, how much calcium does a woman with osteoporosis need? Well, it really depends upon your level. I, I hesitate to give a number um, because I think for an individual with osteoporosis already, I always like to see a measured calcium level to give them a, a dosage on how much calcium they should take in. The same thing with vitamin D. I have lots of patients that I've seen that were taking a thousand units of vitamin D on a regular basis and they had developed osteoporosis and they probably need 5,000 or 10,000. But the answer would be 
If you have osteopenia, if you have a T-score, which is how we measure bone density, if you have a T-score that's less than minus 1.5, that's osteopenia where the bones are getting weak. If you have a T-score of minus 2 or lower, you have osteoporosis. So those individuals really need to be evaluated looking at nutrition, exercise, calcium, uh, vitamin D levels, any medications that may be affecting the strength of your bones, your ability to absorb calcium and vitamin D. So it's something that you really want to make sure that you're evaluating properly. How does carbonated flavored water affect the bones? That's a great question. Carbonation actually does increase the risk of osteoporosis because it affects absorption. Um, the carbonation affects your levels of calcium and vitamin D. So we have to be careful, even if we're drinking carbonated water, that we're not drinking too much of it, that we're not putting anything into our system that's going to affect the GI tract because that affects your absorption of all the nutrients that you need. So again, making a concerted effort to be mindful about what you do on a regular basis, making a concerted effort to meet with your physician on a regular basis, even if you're healthy, you still want to meet with him or her maybe once or twice a year to get a wellness checkup to know what risk factors you might have that are leading you down a road towards a chronic illness. And also setting up a plan, I call it an optimal health plan, to make sure that you're staying healthy and vital and productive as you get older. So doing your wellness assessment is so important, making sure that you're really mindful about uh, your health on a regular basis, making health your number one priority. I always tell people uh, that health should be your number one priority because you wanna make health last and then you can do everything else that you need to do. So again, thanks to everyone that joined today. We had a bunch of people on the line today. Spread the word to as many people as you can that we're here to educate. That CHIP is a phenomenal tool that allows you to create a solution to so many of the healthcare problems that we have today. So use it, benefit from that, spread the word to everyone else, and plan on uh, meeting me back here next week, same time, same channel. God bless until then. Thank you all.